Welcome everyone to the first session for the Putting Public Health Evidence in Action to Prevent and Control Cancer Training. It, we'll be presenting a six part series. This is the first of the six. My name is Mary Wongan and I'm a research associate with um, North Carolina site of the Cancer Prevention and Control Research Network. And I'll be presenting this session and the second session. And we also have Thomas Goffrey with us if you'd like to introduce yourself. Um, Dr. Thomas Goffrey will be teaching a couple of the sessions. Go ahead, Kam. Oh, we got to let her unmute. Thank you, Mary. Okay. okay. I want to welcome everybody to the training. It's great to see um, almost 50 plus people here today. Um, this curriculum is a part of uh, the work of um, the Cancer Prevention and Control Research Network and this cycle and, and many other cycles, and we're updating it. So we hope that you will give us uh, feedback um, on all of the series, if you can attend them all or this one. Um, I am professor at um, Emory School of Public Health in the Behavioral Sciences and Health Education Department. And I will be presenting on the uh, um, adapting EBIs and also evaluating evidence-based interventions. Um, so the fourth and sixth modules that we'll be presenting, and I look forward to talking to you then. Thank you, Kam. And Dr. Jennifer Lehman, professor in the School of Nursing, will also be presenting um, some of the sessions. Um, I don't think she was able to make it um, today, so we'll just keep um, we'll just move forward. Um, I do want to acknowledge the Cancer Prevention and Control Research Network, as Kam mentioned. The investigators within this network helped to put this training together over a number of funding cycles. And I also um, would like to acknowledge the listed uh, curricula and resources here on this page. Um, so I'd like to introduce the Cancer Prevention and Control Research Network before we get started. It's a national, national network of academic, public health, and community partners who work together to reduce the burden of cancer, especially among those disproportionately affected. Its members conduct community-based participatory cancer research across its eight network centers, crossing academic affiliations and geographic boundaries. This map here shows the current funded centers within the network. The CPCRN is a thematic research network um, of the Prevention Research Centers, which are CDC's flagship programs for preventing and controlling chronic diseases. And both current and past members of the network have contributed to the development of this training over the last 15 years. This is our agenda for, the, for today. I want to first start with just some um, Zoom polls um, to get to know everyone, and then we'll um, move on to define evidence-based practice. We will also describe the framework that we'll use throughout this training for evidence-based practice, as well as an introduction to community and stakeholder engagement as a foundation to evidence-based practice. And once we get to that section of the training, we'll also have an activity um, that will involve the case study I emailed to you all this morning. And if you didn't get the case study, I'll also share my screen and send it to you in the chat. So what is evidence-based practice? So evidence-based um, practice is based on research, and it's important because it lets us know which interventions have been rigorously tested and found to be effective. But it's not the only type of evidence that informs evidence-based practice. Characteristics of the local population, availability of healthcare resources, and the overall context are also important. For example, the reasons why adolescents are not receiving HPV vaccinations may differ according to geographic location, and each may require distinct interventions. So evidence-based practice is about making decisions based on the intersection of all these different types of evidence. We have to decide which proven interventions will address the needs of our patient population, align with the resources that are available and are feasible given the policy, community, and organizational environment. And so working to make these types of decisions is what we will learn more about throughout this training. So then what are evidence-based interventions? 
For the purpose of this training, we define evidence-based interventions as programs, practices, principles, procedures, policies, pills, and products that have been found to be effective in one or more well-designed research studies. Each one of those interventions are very different from one another, but for the purposes of this training, we're lumping them all under the term EBI, or evidence-based intervention. So here are some examples of EBIs. You may have a broad EBI, um, such as a patient reminder to get cancer screening or to get a vaccination. Um, you may have a presumptive announcement, which means that instead of asking a patient if they want to get a colorectal cancer screening, a provider may assume that that's what they're getting that day. Um, so those are examples of broad EBIs that you may find in um, recommendations from the systematic, systematic reviews of evidence, um, perhaps reviews that you might find in the Cochrane Library. And we'll talk more about those types of resources later on in um, this training series. You also have packaged EBIs, and these are bundles of materials and instructions um, that are needed to deliver an EBI. Examples of a packaged EBI might be the flu fit program for colorectal cancer screening or the give teens vaccines program for HPV vaccination. Packaged programs like these can be found on sites like the CDC's evidence-based cancer control programs, which um, we'll also talk more about throughout this training. I want to introduce our framework um, that will guide this training before we get started. Um, so in our next session on March 26th, we'll talk about collecting data to understand the problem and using that to establish our goals for improvement. And on um, April 16th, Dr. Jennifer Lehman will talk us through finding and selecting EBIs that target our pop our, both our problem that we are trying to solve and fit our population and context. Next, on April 30th, Dr. Thomas Goffrey will discuss the do's and don'ts of adapting EBIs for an even better fit with your population and context. And then on May 14th, Jennifer Lehman will show us how to create an implementation plan, and Kam will walk us through evaluating our EBIs on May 28th. Today, however, we will um, focus on community and stakeholder engagement, which will be a thread that is woven throughout all of these six steps. So community engagement. When, before we can talk about community engagement, we must first define community. In the context of engagement, community has been understood in a couple different ways. It is sometimes used to refer to those who are affected by the health issues being addressed, such as patients or community members. This use recognizes that the community as defined in this way has historically been left out of the health improvement efforts, even though it's supposed to be the beneficiary of those efforts. On the other hand, community can also refer to stakeholders who are involved in adopting and implementing EBIs into practice to improve the health of a community. These stakeholders may be healthcare providers or public health professionals, much like you all in this training, policymakers, or members of other relevant groups. And this use of um, the definition of community has advantage of recognizing that every group has its own culture and norms and that anyone can take, and take the lead in the engagement efforts. So then community engagement. Um, the CDC's principles of community engagement define community engagement as the process of working collaboratively with and through groups of people affiliated by geographic proximity, special interests, or similar situations to address issues affecting the well being of those people. So it often involves partnerships and coalitions, which we'll talk more about today. And, um, these partnerships can help mobilize resources and influence systems, change relationships among partners, and serve as catalysts for changing policies, programs, and practices to ultimately improve the health of the community. Now, community engagement exists on a spectrum. You can have higher or lower levels of engagement throughout your work, and none are necessarily better or worse than the other, but they're different, and it's important to understand where your engagement efforts kind of fall in the spectrum, especially if you're intending to collaborate or co-lead with a, with a group and you're really only consulting or involving. 
So we'll talk quickly or briefly about each one of these steps along our continuum here. The first step, the lowest level, is to inform. And when you inform your community, this means that you're just providing the community with balanced and objective information to assist them in understanding the problem, alternatives, or solutions. So maybe this is a data brief or a publication or a news article just informing your community. When you're consulting the community, you're actually getting feedback from that community, from your targeted stakeholders on their projects, goals, processes, and shared metrics or strategies for change. One step higher than that is actually involving the community where you work directly with stakeholders to continuously ensure that concerns are consistently understood and considered. Moving up our ladder even further, we may collaborate with our community where we actually partner with stakeholders in each aspect of the decision process, including the development of alternatives and priorities. And at the very top, we may co-lead with our community, which is when we place the final decision-making in the hands of stakeholders so that they drive decisions and implementation of the work every step of the way. I also want to introduce the social ecological model, which is another helpful tool for um, community and stakeholder engagement. When you're working with your partners to select evidence-based interventions for perhaps your hospital or your healthcare system, you'll want to consider which levels of the social ecological model or the SEM you want to impact. And this model was developed to help us better understand the factors that influence health, and it can serve as a framework for planning evidence-based interventions. I'm not going to go through each level during the training today, but this model will come back in, come back up in future trainings in this series. I do today want to talk some about the importance and benefits of community engagement. So engaging your community is important because community members are the ones with the knowledge and the expertise in your community's needs, preferences, and culture. Thus, community engagement is a powerful vehicle for bringing about environmental and behavioral changes that will improve the health of the community and its members. One um, nice benefit of engaging your community is that the community can help set the agenda. They can choose the focus of the project, and this will help ensure that the project's focus is actually a priority of the community that it's um, attempting to serve. Community engagement also can bring about improvements to intervention design and delivery of your intervention as they'll, they can be enhanced by engaging your community members who have in-depth knowledge of the local circumstances. Another benefit is that engaging your community helps to identify ethical pitfalls that you may not have been able to identify otherwise, as well as create processes for resolving them when they arise. It's important to have buy-in in the community um, when, you're when you're working to deliver an intervention. And, um, let's see. and community members have a lot of knowledge and skill that they can bring to the table. So when you engage the community members from the beginning, they're more likely to be receptive of the intervention if they've been involved from the beginning and therefore um, are more likely to you know, buy in to your intervention. All of these efforts can improve um, the, the possibility for your intervention, your project to be sustained. Engaging community members from the start makes it more likely that they will adopt and sustain the intervention long after the initial timeline. So all of these um, efforts here can help lay the groundwork for subsequent collaborations. I do want to mention this very recent narrative review published um, this year in 2021. Um, Pinto et al. reviewed 74 implementation frameworks, and within those frameworks, they identified five community engagement constructs. Um, the constructs they found were communication, partnership exchange, community capacity building, leadership, and collaboration. Now, in all 74 of those frameworks, all of the models reflected one or more of the constructs, which was great, but only 20% reflected all five. So this just shows that there's a little bit more work that we can do to make sure that um, our projects and our interventions are truly engaging our community members. So for the rest of the training, we're going to talk about some ways we might be able to do that. 
by going through the principles essential to community engaged health promotion and research. Um, the, I'm, these principles that we'll go over in the next few slides are adapted from nine principles in this community engagement text that was developed as part of the work of the Clinical and Translational Science Awards Consortium's Community Engagement Key Function Committee. It was published by the CDC and the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. However, we're just going to go over seven of the principles in this training. And um, I'm also going to include an illustration along the way um, from a quality improvement learning collaborative that I was involved in. And um, throughout the process of introducing each principle, I'm going to kind of assess how well we did in our learning collaborative project on each of the principles. So before we get started on going through the principles, I want to provide you with some context on the collaborative project. So in 2018, the American Cancer Society and the North Carolina Community Health Center Association form partnerships with federally qualified health centers in the state. They provided an in-person training on the Institute for Healthcare Improvement um, QI processes, such as AIM statements, uh, process maps, root cause analyses, PDSA cycles, et cetera, to the FQHCs. They also provided or they hosted monthly virtual meetings to facilitate peer learning across the FQHC sites. And they provided technical assistance in the form of strategies such as reminder scripts and provider education materials and data support such as EHR troubleshooting. Our role at UNC was to serve as external evaluators. And so we collected um, all the QI tools and um, assess their, their implementation of evidence-based interventions and also looked at any changes in colorectal cancer screening rates, which is what um, this collaborative targeted. And um, at the end of the collaborative, we conducted a focus group to learn more about the perceptions of the participants um, in, that participated in the collaborative as part of the federally qualified health centers. So now um, that you have the context of the collaborative, we're going to walk through seven principles of community engagement and kind of assess how well we did with the collaborative. So the first principle is to be clear about the purposes or goals of the engagement effort and the communities you want to engage. So in the, in the example from the collaborative, members of the collaborative signed a contract that outlined the goals of engagement and the expectations of each member of the partnership at the start. So this was pretty big for the FQHC members in the focus group. They mentioned that, you know, the contract, it showed them, they knew what to expect and they knew that they were expected, you know, to attend the training. Um, it was an agreement and a goal that was set ahead of time. The second principle is that um, you should understand the community's culture, economic conditions, social networks, political structures, et cetera. And within the collaborative, FQHC staff completed a readiness assessment to share their current strategies and processes. So that was one way the partnership was able to get a little bit of a sense of the community's um, culture and current capacity. FQHC partners also created and shared process maps and gap analyses to better understand the current state of their own clinics. And this was shared with the rest of the collaborative as well. The third principle is that um, you should establish relationships, build trust and seek commitment from community organizations and leaders to create processes for mobilizing the community. So within the collaborative, FQHCs formed quality improvement um, they formed quality improvement teams with representation from current quality improvement leaders and clinic staff in various roles and levels of leadership. So this was an example of them uh, mobilizing the current leaders and staff members within their community. And then partnering with the North Carolina Community Health Center Association also increased trust as they represent and serve the interests of the federally qualified health centers. Principle four, collective self-determination is the right of a community. No external entity should assume it can bestow on a community the power to act in its own self-interest. So the literature on community empowerment strongly supports the idea that problems and potential solutions should be defined by the community 
communities and individual individuals need to own and name the issues and the problems. And then they need to be the ones to identify action areas and plan and implement strategies and evaluate outcomes. So when it came to the collaborative, the focus was on colorectal cancer screening and that was determined by the funders of the collaborative and the collaborative hosts, not the community or the FQHCs. So in this example, we didn't adhere to this principle as well. However, FQHCs were encouraged to select the strategies and EBIs upon which they wanted to focus once they joined the collaborative. Principle five, awareness of the cultures of a community and factors affecting diversity must be paramount in planning, designing, and implementing approaches to engage in a community. So the, the collaborative had some advantage because the FQHCs provide care to underserved and minority populations. And the purpose of the collaborative efforts is to decrease disparities in colorectal cancer screening rates within those populations. However, more work could have been done to actually engage the community served by the FQHCs. For example, um, the activities within the collaborative could have emphasized more of a patient focus and included them in the process. Principle six, community engagement can only be sustained by identifying and mobilizing community strengths and by developing the community's capacity and resources to make decisions and act. Um, so results from our focus group discussion actually showed that the members of the collaborative took the quality improvement processes and EBI strategies that they learned and used them beyond not just the collaborative timeline, um, but they also applied them to other areas that they wanted to improve, such as HPV vaccination. And our last principle, principle seven, community collaboration requires long-term commitment by the, by the engaging organization, by engaging, oh wait, sorry, by the engaging organization and its partners. So in our case, the collaborative timeline, the funding period lasted just one year, but partnerships have continued since then and the collaborative model um, hosted by the American Cancer Society has actually expanded to additional FQHC clinics in additional states as well as in other cancer prevention um, topic areas like breast cancer screening and HPV vaccination. Um, additionally, this work led to a successful application for a CDC colorectal cancer screening program in North Carolina, which is meant to increase screening rates and provide follow-up colonoscopies to program eligible participants. So I'd like to say that we adhere to principle seven pretty well there. It's nice to see that the collaborative has um, grown as much as it has. So now that we've gone through all of those seven principles, and I know that was a lot to take in at once, we're going to get a chance to apply it ourselves. So I send a case study out this morning and I can send it out again in the chat and I'll also share it on my screen. Um, but I want you to think through, read the case study, you can, I'll give you some time to do that and think about which of those seven principles are present in the work done in the case study. Um, the case study is Improving American Indian Cancer Surveillance and Data Reporting in Wisconsin and I will send you the electronic handout. And then I'm also going to open up a poll and, that, and the poll will have the seven principles and you can check yes or no if you think the principle exists. And then, um, let's see. And then, so I, like, here's an example of what I did with the quality improvement collaborative example. I gave it a check for the ones that I thought the principles existed in, and then um, we can fill, out, fill this out as a group through the poll.
Now, there's not really a right or wrong answer. These can be kind of subjective and um, you could probably argue um, whether or not the principles were adhered to, you know, either way in most cases, but it's good to get a sense um, for what, um, for how these principles might be applied in the, in the study and how well um, a project may have adhered to them. So take a look at all the results and then um, I'm also going to share um, the answers that that I came up with and then we can talk, I'll talk through it a little bit and we may have some time at the end for any questions. Okay. Okay, so back to the slides. Um, I saw a lot of people picked um, number one and I didn't find principle one um, but that's okay. It doesn't mean that it wasn't there. Um, I did think that the project um, in this example was a successful application of community engagement um, in a complex multi-site project. And they used the method that we talked about briefly before, community-based participatory research. And the use of that method shows that, really shows adherence to principle two, which stresses the importance of understanding the community's perceptions of those initiating the engagement activity. Um, the project also engaged diverse partners, which applies to principle three, and um, which asks organ organizers of community engagement to establish relationships and work with existing structures. Following these two principles is especially important in this case study due to the history of racism suffered in American Indian communities. The researchers were also able to build trust by sending the raw data that they collected back to health directors and clinic staff so that they could assist in the analysis and the interpretation. In this way, they were able to capture the local perspectives when it came to that data, um, which were then used to plan EBIs specific to their community. Um, as far as um, Principle four was concerned. I didn't see that as much because the topic was already kind of decided in the outset. Um, principle five, um, um, I definitely saw in the case study um, because they were able to share their data with the different clinics. The project reflected the clinic's diversity um, as stressed in principle five. And then finally, the principle seven, um, I thought was there because of the four years of partnership and the potential for more projects in the future. Um, which um, in principle seven, which states that long-term commitment is required for community engagement to truly succeed. Um, and so the project success here is not is measured not just in terms of improving the accuracy of the cancer data for the American Indians in Wisconsin, but also by the ongoing deeper relationships that were formed. And so that's everything that I have for you all today. Um, did were there any questions or any um, anything that anyone wanted to bring up? And that's okay too. If you have questions that you think of ahead of, or afterwards, do feel free to email them to us, and we can try to get them answered for you. Um, I do want to um, ask that you complete an evaluation survey that we'll send out. We'll include it here in the chat, and we're also going to send it to you in a follow-up email. Um, as I mentioned before, too, these trainings um, are being recorded, and we're going to update the CPCRN's training section of their website to include all these new recordings, as well as the updated curricula at the end of the series. So be on the lookout for that, and we'll follow up with um, slides and the materials afterwards as well. And then another plug to register for the rest of the sessions if you're interested. The next one is on March 26th. Um, and if you need the link, let me know. I can send it back out to you too. Oh, I, I see a question about where in the case study it mentions four years. That may have been missing in the case study, and if it is, I apologize. Um, but the case study came from the that 
um, community or principles of community engagement text that I mentioned in the slides. So if you go back and read through that a little more, um, you might it might be in that area. So I apologize if it was missed in the case study. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, thank you everyone for attending and we hope to see you on March 26th.